Good evening. My name is Chris Lynch. Tonight we're starting with a public hearing on West High Renovation. Declare this public hearing open. Right. Now is the time. Oh, now is the time and place for the public hearing on the proposed plans and specifications for the West High School renovation and addition project. The board of directors set the date for this public hearing on May 23rd, 2017. Notice the public hearing was published in the Iowa City Press Citizen on May 24th, 2017. The dis district will receive bids on this project at 2 p.m. June 15th, 2017 at the Educational Services Center located at 725 North Dodge Street in Iowa City, Iowa, 52245. Notice to contractors was published as required by law in multiple statewide plan rooms and on the Iowa City Community School District website on May 24, 2017. Are there any questions from the board? Are there any questions from the public? Thanks, Brian. I declare this public hearing closed. Welcome to the Iowa City Community School District School Board meeting on Tuesday, June 13th. I'd like to thank those in the audience and those on TV for taking an interest in our district business. I'd also like to thank our students from Wickham and North Central for providing the uh, artwork behind us. I'd like to call this meeting to order and start tonight by introducing those at the table with me. To my right is Superintendent Steve Murley, and Directors Lori Rowland, Phil Hemingway, Brian Kersling, Latasha Deloche, Paul Rosler, Chris Liebig, and Recording Secretary Kim Colvin. The public is reminded if they wish to speak, they need to complete a speaker form, file at the table in the lobby and turn it in. During community comments, persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. All community comment directed at non-agenda and agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting during the community comment section of the agenda. And with that, the next item on the agenda is the ICA update. I understand there is no update. That's correct. Mitch and Brady are both out of town today. So with that, we will move on to community comment. Thank you for your interest in Iowa City Community School District and for your willingness to share your comments. You're reminded to give your name, address, and the topic you wish to speak during community comments. People. Persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to district. All community comment directed at non-agenda and agenda items shall take place beginning of the meeting and shall be limited to four minutes per speaker. The initial community comment shall be limited to one hour. Remaining community comment to the extent necessary shall take place at the end of the meeting. To the extent you are commenting on items not on our posted agenda, the board may ask follow-up questions, but is prohibited by Iowa Open Meetings Law from responding to questions from speaker or engaging in substantive, substantive discussion regarding non-agenda items. First up tonight will be Julie Van Dyke, and on deck is Lucas Van Orden. I've looked at the task force review from the uh, solitary confinement cells that you have lovingly referred to as timeout rooms, um, and uh, I'm disappointed. Um, it says here at the beginning in December 13, 2016, the school board directed special education administration to put together a team to review the use of seclusion rooms and physical restraints. Um, December 13th, the first meeting doesn't even happen until February. I can see that you really prioritized that one, didn't you? Two months, you know, two more months of kids in those horrible rooms. Um, I've looked through it. It says seclusion is designed to provide a, the student an opportunity to calm down and resolve issues of safety. How is it designed to provide an opportunity to calm down? It's confinement used as an intimidation and threat to cause compliance by force or threat. Those kids are threatened. You're going to go into the room. You're going to go into the room. It's used to intimidate and threaten children. <coughs> um, I, I looked at this and I wish that I could say I'd know more. I asked to be on this committee and was ignored. Um, but what I do say, see on the task force activities here is that the location and construction as well as pictures of the district seclusion spaces were viewed and discussed. Pictures? Did they go on tours? Did you take the committee? Did you take this group into any of these rooms? And if you did, how many? Pictures? Those rooms stink. They stink like petroleum. It smells like a gas tank in the one at Horn. You know, how are they going to get that through the pictures? How many of these rooms did they visit? And how many of them were actually closed into one of those rooms to experience what any of our kids experience in those rooms for, oh, say, 30 minutes? How many of you have done that? Go in one of those rooms and sit in there for 30 minutes and see how you feel, how empowered you feel to do better when you come out. It's a jail cell. 
There's no HVAC in the one at Horn that I could see. My pictures, which I still haven't shown yet, show a pegboard in the back um, at the top of the room, just like tagboard stuff or pegboard stuff with holes in it. That's the, that's the air in there. Not all of these schools are even air conditioned. So these rooms, these cells are in the middle of a room where the child that's been forced into one locked in there as the case may be and that they're not able to exit they did put door handles on them after after they tried to clean them up a little bit for the press citizen thing um, before that there was no door handle on the inside i have pictures of it um, and those cells are in the special ed room where all the other kids in the room are sitting there and hear hear that kid screaming inside there they they yell at each other back and forth. They try and control the room, but if they could control the room, the kid wouldn't be there in the first place, would they? I'm really upset about this. Um, it, it, I, I'm looking at this, and I'm seeing in our district that over and over again, we, we're all about our AP classes and how many college kids, how many kids we have going to college and our shiny new expensive buildings and our fat bond. But I'd remind you of something that Hubert Humphrey said in November of 1977, the former US Vice President. He said, the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. What's your moral test? What, what's too much for you? Is it too much for you to go into those rooms and sit in them? Do what our kids have to do before you vote to continue doing what we're already doing. Because I've looked at what the, what the new stuff is happening on here, and I don't see anything exciting and new. Thanks. It's everything that you should already be doing. Thanks, Julia. Lucas? On deck will be Casey Leonard. Lucas is up first, Casey. You'll be on deck. Uh, good evening, Lucas Van Orden. Um, I'm going to kind of rework what I was going to talk about a little bit because I think Julie makes a very good point. Um, it is very important that this board, as it receives this report, uh, takes a very close look to uh, all of the information. Uh, more importantly, it's very important that this board make its decisions and in and implement its changes based on evidence-based decision-making. The emotions are very high. Uh, they should be. Uh, it's very challenging and, and upsetting both for a parent uh, as well as for an instructor who has to uh, deal with a child who uh, abuses them. Uh, we don't hear much about teachers who are bitten, urinated on, uh, suffer concussions. It happens. Uh, that being said, uh, I think it's important to put a, a, a different quality on the report that you have. I noted that your community partners who are listed in this report are just simply names, and that's true, they are. Uh, your community partners are experts in this field. Uh, I know these people personally. They are doctorates in clinical behavior, in child psychology. Um, their voice is very important. These are the people with whom you can look to to ask for qualified experts, their information, their opinion, not a someone told me that this happened or you know, we all have bad experiences, but how you take experience and how you take information in a report and turn it into a productive change that benefits all of the people in this district is very important to that end. Uh, Phil, Chris, I want to thank you both very much for opting out of this decision-making process. A couple weeks ago, you flat out said, I'm going to vote against this. I think that's incredible. And it makes it really very easy because then you have five other board members who are actually willing to receive a report and meet with qualified experts and say, OK, I haven't prejudged this. I don't have a blog. I haven't you know, gone by innuendo. I actually would like some quality information and make a quality decision. That's what leadership is to that end. Latasha, thank you very kindly for your participation on this group. 
A uh, number of people who I talked to said that your involvement, you, you couldn't have picked a better person. You're, no, you're all good folk, okay? But this is my woman, and she's good, and she oh, understands, Lord. and everything I heard was, was high marks. Thanks a bunch. But uh, I got a suggestion for you. Uh, you've got a new director of special ed coming in in a couple weeks. You've got an emotionally charged community. You've got a report that people need to be thinking about. Work session. Sounds like a really good idea. A work session in maybe a month from now. Let Lisa, you know, like kind of find the washroom and, you know, get a desk. But sitting down, drawing in your community partners. Remember, you know, the people like Sean and Brenda who are PhDs in child psychology? You know, sit down with these people. Decompile this report. Talk to your staff. Remember the people who actually work for you who also are your staff experts? If you want to demonstrate leadership, then lead. Lead by talking to the people who work for you and make a good decision based on all of the information you have at hand. And Phil, Chris, I'd be happy if you just sit on your hands and let the other five talk. Thanks, Lucas. Casey? Hello, my name is Casey Leonard. Um, I'm a public school teacher, not here in Iowa City, in a neighboring district. But I live in Iowa City, and I believe that it is our collective responsibility to ensure that the students in our community are receiving the education they deserve. Unfortunately, that is not currently the case in the Iowa City Community School District. I've been deeply disturbed by what I read about the district's use of seclusion boxes, or what is being more palatably called timeout rooms. I'm very concerned about the harmful traumatic effects this practice surely has on the mental health of students who are secluded as a form of punishment, sometimes in front of their peers and by teachers and adults who they are supposed to trust to care for them. I'm concerned about the disproportionality that these boxes are disproportionately used on students with IEPs, students of color, and are placed in low SES schools. I'm concerned about the loss of learning time that these students experience when they're placed in these boxes. I'm very concerned about the teachers that are being instructed to use these boxes as a form of discipline and what impact that has on the student-teacher relationship, which I think is the basis for all effective classroom management. I'm concerned about the retaliatory culture of the Iowa City Community School District, which keeps employees from speaking out against this practice out of fear for their jobs. But I'm also hopeful. I have hope that this community will come together to demand an end to this practice of using seclusion boxes. I have hope that the schools will instead use safe sensory spaces to help students calm down and um, self-regulate so that they can continue to learn. I have hope that the district will commit to providing trauma-informed care training and resources for all teachers and support staff. And I have hope that this board will listen to the concerns of the community and act in a way that best serves the needs, that's the social, emotional, physical, and academic needs of all of its students. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. That's it for community comment tonight. Next item on the agenda is the district business consent agenda. Yes. Uh, I'd like to pull 6, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Sorry, I lost crack. 6. 6, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Entertain a motion. I move that we approve the consent agenda items absent the items pulled by Director Hemingway. That's our second. Second. Fill the bills. Yes. Uh, went through and uh, went through and checked those. Um, had a few questions, but after I went through the uh, invoices, I was able to get uh, from the notes in there. So uh, went through and everything seems appropriate. All right. Who else? Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. Next time on the agenda is the director liaison report, so that's an information only. You can see the information in the packet. That I'll move on. The next item on the agenda is the resolution ordering a special election. I 
Would you like to start this by entertaining a motion? I move that we approve the resolution ordering a special election on the issuance of $191,525,000 in general obligation school bonds. Second. Discussion? I'm going to vote yes on this just because the statute does say once you get the signatures, school board shall vote to put that on the ballot, and I'm fine with that. Uh, I, don't, I don't want it to be interpreted as support for for the bond proposal itself. Maybe it's just an opening. What's that? Yeah. Just kidding. Oh. <clears throat> Further discussion? I would have the same comment as Chris. All right, Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. Nothing you don't have to. I'm going to close it and open it again. There it is. Got it. All votes have been cast, and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. Next time on the agenda is the five, well, the next three items are all from the Policy and Governance Committee, so next item is the 500 series, Brian. Yeah, so the 500 series, if you recall, we had brought them to the board, uh, uh, I believe it was April 11th, um, and the board had a couple of uh, ad additions or comments to make, so we punted it back to the committee where we went through those suggestions. Um, the... Uh, there was one additional suggest. Well, first off, in 503.4, there was a uh, there was a comment made, I believe, by uh, Director Liebig about uh, unhealthy uh, students uh, must refrain from activities which are illegal, immoral, or unhealthy. We struck unhealthy and added in violation of school policies, guidelines, or procedures. Uh, in 503.5, the um, Upon request, and that's that's about uh, uh, corporal punishment, physical force. This is uh, says upon request, the students, parents, or guardians shall be given an explanation of the reasons for physical force within 24 hours. Uh, that's the addition, and then the other one is this came out of our committee discussion as well at 503.2. 503.2. We chose to strike a sentence from the uh, from the third or third or fourth paragraph down fourth paragraph down excuse me um, that seemed to be somewhat redundant and accusatory of uh, guilt of a student in in an incident so we struck that. I was going to ask about that. Um, mm -hmm. So is is the idea that even if you're not a special education student. It's the board's responsibility still to assess the facts of the situation, right? I mean, is that oh, you're feeling like that's implicit? Right. In what's the, the problem. The problem was was essentially um, a determination should be made of whether the student is actually guilty. Yeah, of no, the that's. Misconduct. I understand why that's not a great way to characterize and, it. And when you take it in the context of the entire paragraph, it was deemed to be an unnecessary. We felt it was an unnecessary sentence. So. We're bringing them back. This is, I think, the third time we brought the 500s back, and we appreciate the careful eye that people have added to it. So, that an entertain a motion? Oh, I just have a question um, for, I don't know if it's Steve or Matt, but on um, 503.5, the corporal punishment, where it mm -hmm. says, um, upon request, the parent shall be given an um, explanation. Can you uh, explain to me? Um, what that means, so the parent has to request the explanation, otherwise they don't get it, or am I misunderstanding? No, that's not supposed to, that actually, now that you're saying that, that's supposed to be not in there. Those words are supposed to be crossed out, that's why the team That's why it says within 24 yeah. hours, yeah, that uh, it wasn't supposed to be upon request. They must have just forgot to strike that. So, so just it's just supposed to start that. with, we strike that's upon why request. I have the capital there, they just must have forgot to strike it. So it was just the student's parents or guardian shall be given within 24 hours. Oh, okay, So that's great. just a mistake. That just needs to be. Good eye. Yeah, because that was specifically something I had brought up, so yeah. And the notification of what, what transpired, what, 
That's mm -hmm. what it what it used to read was upon request the students' parents and our. Although I don't think it said guardian, did it? I think we added guardian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so you say upon request the students' parents are given an explanation of the reason for physical force. And so we were saying shall be given, and we're striking the upon request, and we're adding guardian, and then additionally we're putting a time frame of within 24 hours, which is in accordance with the, um, with I think what, what we're talking about when we look at our reports later tonight. Well, and I, th and I think it's uh, significant that we're, we've increased our Graduation requirements to, by one credit and uh, electives by three. Uh, we've cut down on physical education credits by two. Um, so uh, definitely there's going to be a, a need for electives that. Uh, but if you were, yeah, if you recall about the, about the physical education, is that part of that was because of the way that we offer it? Just members of the public might not remember the, uh, the April discussion. So to entertain a motion to approve the 500 series with the... Um, maybe, oh. maybe could I make one more suggestion that maybe would be included in that motion before you make it? Sure. Um, in that same uh, paragraph, and I think that was an improvement in 503.4, uh, substitution were unhealthy, I was still a little worried about that word immoral, and I'd be more comfortable just striking it. I don't know what, I don't know how it's going to be interpreted. And I don't hate to put the district in the position of judging the morality of no, something. No, you're, you're right. That's, that's supposed to be struck. Was that supposed to be struck it's also? Okay, struck. so we can clarify that, that and get that motion. Yeah. Yeah. In violation of school policies, guidelines, or procedures. So I want to make sure we have this, we have this squared away. Kim, you got that? Moral removed. Upon and request, removed. For all in 503.5. Got it. Yep. yep. The moral, the moral, 3.4 and 3.5. It was a riveting committee meeting. Words were flying left and right. So, great job, Kim, in capturing what we did discuss. That captured in the minutes. So, entertain a motion to approve the 500 series with the adjustments discussed. So moved. Second. Further discussion. I do. I do have a few more questions about some of them. Um, so on. 503.5, uh, which is the corporal punishment physical force. The last sentence says uh, we're supposed to develop administrative regulations. Do those exist, or is that has that not happened yet? Where is it yet? Oh, the, those are already in place. So that part of the language was already in the policy and the. Uh, uh, guidelines and procedures already include uh, those. Okay. And are we thinking that that section applies to these seclusion boxes, or is it supposed to be separate from that? Depends how you interpret, I mean, physical force. I believe it's all-inclusive. So when you look at the use of any type of uh, corporal punishment uh, under this uh, particular board policy or any type of physical restraint or force, that would be included in there. Is there, I don't want to get ahead of things, um, but with the seclusion report that's coming, is the idea that there might be some more elaborate elaboration of practices embodied in a policy at some point? Well, that, yeah, there boxes? may be through the administrative guidelines and procedures. Those would be updated then to reflect that. Okay. Um, on 506.1, I'm sorry. You want to go ahead? I'm just curious, are we going to go through these piecemeal? Because I asked in April not to do that. I asked that we that you would email me well, so we could continue to have this conversation. I, I just have a few more questions. Well, I would ask that we have a motion in a second. I would ask that we move ahead and vote on it because we've gone through it three times in committee. I have a problem with writing or piecemealing policy at the board table. Can I we make it? Well, I'm not actually, I mean, I wasn't planning on... Can we make writing it quick? or amending it, uh, but I did have just some questions about what it means. Yeah, and I think we've already found a couple of corrections, so I think it's okay to go through it. Well, thanks for, Chris, let's just make it quick. Okay, Please quick question. 506.1, student records access. 
is there a depth? I mean, what counts as a student record? And specifically, I'm wondering, you know, with the one-to-one -one computer initiative, a student's browser history, is that a student record? The student records are actually defined by state statute. So All right, and is it clear that it does not apply to, for example, the browsing history of a student using a district-owned computer? If you scroll down to the bottom there, you'll see that uh, the Iowa Code is cited, uh, uh -huh. third up from the bottom, on uh, page three of three. Uh, and uh, the state of Iowa, uh, again, defines uh, both student and staff records for the purpose of this statute. Mm -hmm. So those are something that's uh, looked at and amended by the state on a regular basis, and that's one of the reasons that we cite the state statute in here, uh, because of the uh, rate of change of that process. So is that included in there right now? I uh, don't know what uh, I don't know whether uh, the way you're defining it is included in there. We can certainly look that up for you. But again, it's those records are defined by state statute. All right. Next. Thank you. That's it. For the discussion. All right, Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with Directors Deloach, Hemingway, Rotland, Kirschling, Lynch, and Ressler voting yay and Director Liebig voting nay. Thanks, Kim. Next item is Superintendent Directions, Brian. Superintendent Directions uh, 3C, or, yeah, 2C, 2D, 2E, which includes 3C, 3D, 3E. Uh, a number of those were um, penciled in uh, with in relation to the uh, diversity policy from 2013 which does not exist in that form anymore. So 7, 8, 9, 10 uh, under item 7, 8, 9, 10 under 3C have been struck. Um, Director Deloach made a good suggestion that we spell out acronyms. She's done that since since she joined our committee to make sure that we have our acronyms uh, squared away. So in 3C4, we have physical PEPL spelled out and SAVE spelled out, which they're referred to throughout the remainder of the superintendent directions. And for uniformity's sake, we added uh, percent signs instead of having percent and then the word percent. Uh, but other than that, we should be good on that. Questions? Entertain a motion? I'll make a motion. I move that we approve the superintendent directions uh, 2C2D2E. Second. Further discussion? <coughs> Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. Next time on agenda is participation by the public at board meetings, Brian. Yep, the participation by the public at board meetings uh, has been a continually evolving um, discussion since fall 2013. Again, we looked at it as a committee in 2015. Um, in our committee discussion last week, the group felt that our, uh, our participation by the public is working well with four minutes per speaker, with a, a cap of one hour at the beginning, can be extended later, although the couple times that we've come close to that hour, we have extended extra time by a couple minutes. Um, there was one very good suggestion that I don't know how we missed this in 2015, but Director Ressler suggested that that uh, that we add the words um, that uh, additional time may be granted for public speakers requiring services of an interpreter, and that could be with regard to speakers of a foreign language or speakers requiring um, uh, uh, ASL interpreter, so on and so forth, because we felt that their um, time at the mic was being shortened by the uh, translation process. I appreciate that, Ed, because I don't think it's ever necessarily been an issue, but it's, it's concerned me a few times that it could have been an issue, and it just mm -hmm. clarifies that we have a way to do that. So that was a good suggestion. Really like that, yeah. Questions? Well, I would. I, I wish we would uh, allow comment on agenda items, and uh, I 
think that we miss out on a, uh, a lot of community input uh, with that. And uh, I think our one and done board action too uh, doesn't lend itself uh, to community in information and involvement and participation and our decision making and I wish we were more on a, like we used to be with uh, first, second and third readings like the city and county governments. We actually discussed how our public comment policy um, relates in accordance to our uh, are the UEN partners, uh, the districts across the state, as well as uh, municipal. We, going back to 2015, we actually had a spreadsheet that um, broke down when community comment occurs, how much time each speaker is allotted, how often they're able to speak, so on and so forth. So we did review that at the committee level. But thank you for the suggestion. Entertain a motion. I move we approve the participation by the public at board meetings level 2A, 2B, and 2C as presented. Okay. Further discussion? I'm actually still not comfortable with cutting people off after an hour, uh, especially if something's going to get voted on that night. So to say the remaining comments shall take place at the end of the meeting kind of makes it pointless at that point. Further discussion? Camera ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors DeLoach, Rotland, Kirschling, Lynch, and Ressler voting yay, and directors Liebig and Hemingway voting nay. Thanks, Kim. Next time on the agenda is the timeout room study group update. Steve? <coughs> I'm going to invite uh, Jane to come up. She's going to get things started. Uh, and uh, she gets uh, going. I think uh, one of the things that she's going to do is uh, just uh, call to our attention the fact that uh, we are uh, uh, fortunate to have many members of the uh, committee uh, present with us today. And we certainly uh, thank them for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us this evening. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, board. Um, that was my starting announcement tonight, too, is to thank all of our committee members. Um, so you're able to look through the list um, and I echo what was commented on earlier. We had um, what I thought was a really high quality, committed, uh, trained group that got together very consistently. We um, participated in seven different meetings and then had a group together for a final recommendation report just to um, make sure that the information was accurate per the committee work. And uh, again, several of those members are here and sitting toward the back and I appreciate their time. Um, for coming this evening as well. I've asked a couple of our committee members, um, Mary Roberts and Sean Casey, to come up and help answer some specific questions. So I'm just going to start with a basic overview of the recommendations, and Latasha, feel free to jump in there as well. Um, and then I'll, we'll turn it over to any questions from folks. So I, I do want to start by um, talking about the, the release of the state complaint report. Um, the timing on that made things a little confusing for people. Um, the report initially was intended to come out on um, the first part of May, and there was a, a delay in that release um, from the State Department. So um, our group work ended on May 22nd as a committee. The report was released on June 5th, so the committee had already completed its work um, and had made the recommendations. So while there's a lot of overlap with that report, it was not part of the task force report because we just did not have the findings um, were not able to be included because of the, um, it, was, it was released after our group was co had completed their work. The group did, however, anticipate the release of that report in the future, and so there was a recommendation to make sure that the findings were addressed as we look toward uh, developing an action plan that incorporates any of the pieces left from the CAP, the pieces from this particular committee, and then also the findings from the state complaint. So as we started through this process, we realized it was more than just looking at the spaces themselves that we really needed to make a more, more holistic view of what is our training component, what are, um, how do we document situations. Um, there was more to it than just looking at the spaces themselves. So the review included that Hanover report that you received, and that was kind of our guiding document through a lot of our work. We also included Chapter 103. Um, we reviewed the district procedures for the use of seclusion and physical restraint. 
We went through the training and the PD that is offered at this time, which includes any of the de-escalation strategies, to making sure that we have quality FBAs and BIPs um, to address the student needs and behavior, and then also alternatives to seclusion, and looking at the district-wide initiatives that are going right now, um, which um, includes the implicit bias training and PBIS training specifically. We looked at our incident reporting forms themselves to see can we make those better um, and are they giving us the data that we need in order to make better decisions about programming for students. So as we looked at making those recommendations then, we looked at the items that could be accomplished um, more immediately, such as the name change that has been um, a topic of a lot of conversation and some confusion. And so the team made the recommendation, um, again, based on some of the, the information in the Hanover report, to start using the term seclusion room as opposed to timeout. Um, the timeout term um, was one that was just established when those rooms were constructed. Um, I've not been able to find out the first year that the rooms were brought into our elementary or secondary buildings, um, but we know that name was attached um, as far back as we can find. So we do recommend, in keeping with current language, that we do change that. Um, to continue to work um, with district-wide trainings to ad address the disproportionality, to increase our specific response training and de-escalation strategies um, so that we can reduce the um, use of those more restrictive practices and create a long-range plan for district special education that incorporates the citations in the state complaint response, continues to work through the completion of the DE corrective action plan, and then also addresses the recommendation of this particular task force. We all recognize that we did not get in this place overnight, and we need a very purposeful and, um, and informative plan in order to move things forward and be very intentional in the strategies and the procedures that we set into place. Ultimately, our goal then is to significantly reduce the use of seclusion and the number of minutes that any child um, would need to be in that particular environment. So I think at this time, um, I'm going to, uh, Lisa Ann Johnson, who is also a critical member of this team, she's part of our district challenging be behavior team and did some of the presenting of information for the, the work that was done by this particular group. So if the board has specific questions that they would like to ask, I know one that I was um, emailed earlier was as we start to work through um, reducing the number of seclusion rooms that we have in the district. Um, we have one specifically identified um, at this particular time at one of our buildings for deconstruction, and we have another where there's been a request at the end of the year they did not use the room all year and would like the door removed because of the particular material of that space within the building that it's in, it would require a lot of work to remove that space itself, but they're going to repurpose that room, um, which they've done before for students to self-select um, quiet time or just space um, independent of, of the rest of the class that they need to to, to um, regain some self-control or just um, kind of seclude themselves. So um, that's an update on that piece right now. Our building-wide data um, was tabulated at the end of last week, so we'll start going through that building by building and see what the use was and start talking with the staff in those buildings. If it was a very low rate, those probably could be other rooms that we could start um, deconstructing as well. We currently have uh, 21 rooms in 16 different schools, um, so we can immediately reduce two of those uh, at the start of the, of the summer here. So Jane, your two would be eliminated by the start of the school year? Correct. Summer. And then you're proposing this committee continues to meet four times a year, was it? Correct. And Correct. this committee that you've we would like members from this committee just to keep that, that in um, the history of the work that this group's done and to be able to add to some of the conversations. Um, and so moving ahead, then look at maybe some more community partners. One of the recommendations was looking at our communication plan and trying to get that more public. So if we have some other folks coming in to help review our data with um, maybe more of a, an objective view and, and to give suggestions that way that that would help keep us on target. So the idea would be they'd meet quarterly and then report to the board and we would have a, a public report as well. And so is there anything specifically you need from the board tonight? I would ask to accept the recommendations and to um, allow us to move forward with developing that action plan with some specific timelines and dates attached to it. So maybe this is the question you're going to get to, but why not just eliminate them? I mean, well, I'm going to put my experts up here. Sounds good. So, hi. Thanks again for letting us uh, talk with you and in front of everybody here as well. Um, there, there's, there's a continuum of different um, uh, uh, options for uh, for folks with challenging behaviors ranging from very 
low intrusive interventions to all the way to very high intrusive interventions. And so when we're talking about uh, timeout rooms or seclusion rooms is the, the technical term that we're using at the Department of Education, it's that it is used in crisis management procedures, uh, particularly um, when, um, uh, when children are out of control or cannot be um, uh, correctly uh, corralled with their behavior plan or if there's a failure of the behavior plan to be effective. Uh, this may be the only safe alternative for kids uh, for us to uh, be able to work with. So there's always going to be a need for um, these types of um, possibilities for kids that are, are out of control as opposed to other types of options that have been available historically. So this is one of the best types of options that would be available for uh, kids in an inclusive environment in a school, in their neighborhood school, in a local education agency. So, so I don't know if the obliteration of these to, to, to reduce these down to zero is realistic, but I do believe that there is, um, um, uh, everybody is in agreement on this, in this particular team that reducing the use of those is very important and, and, and very doable. So let's say you didn't have them and the other things are what? The other things, what, from different uh, options? Uh, like, for example, um, we have data statewide with our, our challenge behavior teams that uh, when they go in and they do an FBA and, and develop a behavior intervention plan based off of that function-based assessment, that timeout or, or seclusion use and seclusion time is reduced by over 100%. So everybody who accesses those types of technologies is one way of being able to avoid the use of those. And so that, that's certainly one aspect of that. Uh, PBIS, Tier 1 interventions, Tier 2 interventions are also very successful in reducing those. And so, so there are lots of strategies that can prevent that. But typically what we would do is we would go from least intrusive interventions all the way up to more intrusive interventions as the, as the, as the student's behavior dictates, particularly as, as the treatment plans particularly fail with kids, you go up in, in levels of intrusiveness. So if a child's not playing tag appropriately outside, that's not a place where you would put a child in seclusion. Uh, but if a child's about to hit another child in the face with a chair, that's a great place to intervene and get involved with that as a way to de-escalate that particular situation. Yeah, could you uh, clarify on, on your saying that uh, essentially that we can't get along without them. Can you explain how some districts don't have them and, and are able to work without them? In some of our buildings. Sorry, I, uh, which question you want? In some of our buildings as well. Right. Well, again, and, and uh, as uh, as uh, the committee had talked about, and I can't, I can't, I can't explain what other districts do. They're, they're, you know, it's not something I can, I can specifically talk about. But w within this district, where some of the buildings don't have them, the, the reasons for the, the the elimination of them is that they're not using them. That the, the children in those particular settings are, are are seemingly just fine with other types of interventions that are in place. Um, I I've worked in I've worked in challenging behavior since. Uh, 1991, and I've worked with the worst of the worst. I've worked with uh, children who have had very significant challenge behaviors, including self-injury, to the point where they have hurt themselves to the point that they needed to be hospitalized from headbanging on concrete floors or, or walls. And in certain cases, you're going to need to get in between them to be able to do that. Um, and there, I've worked with individuals with very severe, profound disabilities that will bite digits off of their fingers. And again, we need to intervene under those circumstances the best that we possibly can. If the district is going to assume uh, the responsibility for all kids within their district, it's going to include kids with very significant challenge behaviors, and therefore all interventions should be on the table. The, the, the people who should have access to them should be very limited to those who have expertise with it, though. So. Well, and, uh, you know, the first off, uh, the state finding uh, one of the biggest things, or one thing that they said is that we just got to stop the whole time out seclusion confusion uh, that way and and that was part of it um, you, so if I understood Jane's explanation you guys did not really get a chance to go through the, uh, the state report as a committee a committee no not as a committee but I have right right and uh, I've had a chance to kind of look through there too and uh, there was of the 455 uh, incidents reported and of course we're all we're self-reporting so uh, you know we have cameras in all of our schools except in areas sometimes I think where it'd be most important like in seclusion rooms mm -hmm. in, in those areas um, 277 incidents were third graders or younger mm -hmm. and the the 
younger kids have the longest stays in the rooms. Can you explain that? I can't. I can't explain that report. We didn't talk about it as a group. I'm really on, the, on my parameters for talking about this here, about the group that we've done. I want to contain it to, to what we've done as a group, not uh, the Department of Education's particular position on a report that I didn't author. Well, it, it's, it's uh, you know, when, when we, we look at using it for the uh, for, to protect the safety of staff and the student, when we're talking about pre-kid, pre-K children, which 46 were put into seclusion boxes, it's hard for me to really feel that we've got to lock a four to five year old up in a six by six cell because we can't calm them down. Um, is there, um, it's, that sounds like a statement. I'm not sure if there's a question. Well, I, I, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm, you know, with, with your statement uh, to begin with that uh, essentially we can't do without them. Um, I'm really, uh, did you spend, did the committee spend time looking at districts that do it, do it without them? We, we analyzed the data that were within Iowa City, so that, that was what the purview of the, the, the group was, was to, to look at the data that we had. Okay, uh, so and, and so you did have these number, these incident numbers and things like that in length of stay? I believe so. I, I believe we, ha we, had, we had data that we looked at to, to <coughs> take a look at this. It may not have been in the same format in the report that you're looking at right there, but we had the similar data that we looked at. Yes. Okay. So Steve. And, you don't? Sorry. And and uh, and our and as I understand it, our action plan with the state, uh, we're, we're compelled uh, to uh, to have our action plan in effect by the is it the 28th of August, or we're supposed to turn it in on the 28th, and then the state will approve and give us revisions by November 26th. Is that correct, Jane? That's correct. Okay. So as is. As, as, uh, is the committee going to continue to help with this, or is this uh, how how are how are we going forward with that piece? Will be the special education leadership team because that's very specific um, to um, that particular complaint. So that would be something again. Um, I like the recommendation of a of a work session to look at all three of those things. They are very intersected and over um, intertwined. There are pieces of that report that we've already um, completed because of the work from the um, Department of Education Corrective Action Plan, and the, there, there were some notations in that to have that, that piece submitted. So um, I, I hate to get away from the work that we've done with the, the task force today, and that's something that we need to, again, um, pull together. We have those dates, and we, we really aren't concerned about being able to meet those timelines. So. First off, thank you for the work that the committee has done. I know it's a, it's a number of meetings. It took a while to get uh, individuals assembled and get calendar to, to work out to make sure that everybody can be there. We want to make sure that folks could, in fact, be there. I saw that there was one individual who could not make all the meetings and, and decided that to, re to resign from the committee. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So um, I, I, too, believe that, that there's a lot of data here, both in the Hanover report and the articles that are cited in the Hanover report. Additionally, there's a lot to unpack with regard to the recommendations on behalf of the committee. And, and I think there's a great group of, I'm just gonna say, it, of professionals who, who you know, are, are trying to find the best, the best way forward for, for our kids, the best way forward for our teachers, um, and, and I think that there's a lot to unpack here between the, what Director Hemingway is talking about, the Department of Ed report, the Hanover report, the report from you guys. And, and I would be very, very supportive of, of getting into a work session. I do agree that Lisa has to be allowed to, you know, fi figure out which keys open what. But um, I think that, that, that there's no question that the community wants to know what, uh, what we're going to, you know, what more we're going to do with this, and so I'll just, I'm just going to say it. I would be very supportive of, of putting this on a work session agenda, so we can. Jane, is that your reco work session in August? Say that one more time, Chris. Is your recommendation a work session in August? I, I think that would be enough time. Yeah, we've got the deadline of the of the, yeah, of we, the we, state we've got, compliance. We've got to have something by the 20. Well, we just have so. to have a response to that. Because that then we can already in place. Then we can collectively review it, and that would work. One thing that would be helpful to add to that is, um, maybe this is more of a discussion of a board, is that 
we can have a policy about the use of these rooms. And so, and in some cases, um, there were children that were in um, these spaces that didn't have IEPs. And so some of the discussions is, should we allow children who do not have this as part of their plan into these spaces? Right. So that's a board decision. We would have to make that. So I'm I, one of my recommendations outside of all the amazing work. I mean, y'all really don't understand the amazing people that were in this um, group and committed to hash it out um, to specifically start with the drafting of some policy language from, since we are a policy making board, specifically to get some more information about what that development looks like. Uh, because that one would be a way to reduce disproportionality because we know a significant number of those children were African American children. Um, and then it, it also will help us push to keep pushing us forward about other ways that we can do some reduction. Um, amazing, um, sometimes awful stories about how they ended up at that point where the rooms were in use. So I think we need to also consider that. But I, I do think as a policy making board, we can create policy about the use of those rooms. Um, and we don't have a, a policy. It's in, well, we have the Iowa Code, but we don't have our own Iowa City Community School District policy. So it's a suggestion to, um, I mean, obviously, you know where policies start, right? It's a suggestion to, I just wanted to get the chronology here, to, because we're not planning as PNG meeting until September. Right. So should we do work session with the ultimate yes. goal of getting to PNG? Yeah, I think what we need to start doing is gathering some of that information from other districts about their policy that sure. we'll be able to draft and create our own policy. Because at some point, I mean, we can have committee after committee <clears throat> doing great work, but at some point as a policymaking board, we have to have a policy about this, mm -hmm. and we don't. Mm -hmm. And so coming up with a policy speaks more volume than just saying, you guys figure it out, and then we don't you know, we vote yay or nay, keep making these recommendations or not. I think if we're going to step out there, then we need to help draft that policy and get it on the books. I'll so, Jane and Steve, could you help us collect policies by the August work session yeah. to see a range of what's out there? Mm -hmm. So bring in uh, uh, examples both in and out of state in terms of policies and use that as a starting point for our conversation? Yes. Yeah. Does, Let's continue on. Does the committee have a place to start with? I mean, did it? One thing I'd say is that you're a very large district, so when you're looking at um, district policies, I'd look at districts that are similar Some size as yourself. Yes. No. Is that something a handover, handover can pull for us? For out of state, we could certainly reach to them. I think in state through the Urban Education Network, we could gather all that information from our counterparts, both the uh, original eight and the plus nine. And along with that, too, I'd recommend that we make sure we get the, the um, accurate data in your hands, too, as you start looking at, at developing that policy, too, so it's based on practice and, and actual numbers of kids in the district, too. And I appreciate the comment about the level of expertise on this committee. I um, have been in amazement with the people that, that were very willing to dedicate their time to this, um, to this topic. But I also want to recognize we have several people out here, too. We've got, um, we had some great parents sitting at the table with us to remind us what it feels like from their end. And we also had, um, we had paraeducator, we had a special education teacher, we had gen ed teachers, we had administration as well. So it really was, in my mind, a, a very well-rounded team representing a lot of different, different people here. But the parent input was, was invaluable. Um, can I ask a few questions? Actually, just a mixture of questions and a few thoughts. <laughs> Um, one of my questions is in the report, it taught, by the way, I appreciate, I mean, a lot of effort went into this, a, a lot of good things in the report. I think it's trying to, I completely agree with the emphasis of trying to reduce the need, the use, et cetera, of all these things. Um, one of the places it mentions, um, uh, which page am I on? Page three, I guess, talks about the development of a therapeutic classroom model at Weston City High. And so, of course, immediately I thought, we have three high schools. And also, we have junior highs and elementary schools. I mean, what's the what's the where's that going to go with the? I like the idea of a therapeutic classroom. Is there any reason we wouldn't also do it at the junior high level? Or what we're looking beyond? at doing is is really looking more at the at, at the model and the supports that are in place in those particular classrooms. 
So across the district, one of the, the things that we're working with uh, Kareen Frank on is our SFA positions are social work positions. And so we have several of those people in, in the district. So what she's looking at doing is realigning that particular staff so we can look more at the LISWs being in our buildings where we have behavior-focused classrooms because there tends to be um, a, a higher rate of, um, of, of need for, for de-escalation strategies and for that, that uh, the coping strategy, someone to be there to provide that in, um, intervention and support. So as she's looking at her SFA staff, we're looking at maybe um, that higher level of trained person being in those behavior-focused classrooms because kids, kids have support plans that are specific to receiving that kind of support. So you can call it therapeutic classroom, you can call it behavior focused. It really is focused on what the child's IEP dictates as far as supports and services for them. So we're trying to align what we have um, in the way of professional expertise in the district where those programs where they're needed the most. But at the junior high level then would it be would this be sort of a pilot for what could happen at the junior high level, or is that something we're already doing under a different name at the junior high level? We have had it at the junior high level. Um, we're going to continue. We've got an LISW at um, two of the junior highs right now that have um, that will be supporting the behavior-focused classrooms there. We did not have that same level um, at the two high schools, and so that's why we did some transitioning with those programs there. We also had some students transitioning out of that model into the high schools um, that we wanted to make sure we could continue that support to as well. And I guess pulling back a little bit to looking at then at the uh, Hanover report, um, you know, on page 10, first thing, it, first thing it talks about under expert commentary is how it's a highly controversial practice and there are, you know, a lot of expert criticisms of the practice too. Um, and I guess, you know, to the extent that there's real disagreement among experts on it, how do you go about choosing which experts you're going to listen to? Yeah, I think this is something, and just for some context, because I don't know some of you, um, my name's Mary Roberts. Professionally, I'm the Autism Center Coordinator at the University of Iowa Children's Hospital. Personally, I have two young adult children, both of whom are profoundly autistic. Um, they were in the Iowa City School District from age 3 to 21. They've since aged out. Um, I have quite a bit of experience with them with seclusion and restraint. Um, I'm also the president and co-founder of a local disability organization called the Village Community. We work with um, young adults who are pretty profoundly behaviorally affected. So I live and work with people who have experienced seclusion and restraint. And one of the things I just wanted to say is no one that I know of, especially on this committee and the people we've worked with in the district, are pro-seclusion and restraint. Unfortunately, it's a necessary tool for kids like mine. Um, it's something that, you know, no, I don't want my daughter to be put in this box. But if the alternative is she's restrained and either she and or the staff person restraining her could potentially be injured, then it's the lesser of two evils. So I just wanted to clarify that it's not something that, you know, you may have variant expert opinions on this. I think a lot of it, uh, the level of behavioral need needs to be taken into account. And I think some people don't necessarily have a wide berth of experience with how aggressive, how self-injurious some of these students can be. And we don't want to have it all or nothing where they can't be maintained in a public school environment with their peers because they do have these behaviors, but at the same time we need to keep them and staff and other students safe. So Yeah, I mean I, I agree that there's more shared ground I think there than people, or people maybe see. Uh, I certainly understand that there are people who are going to hurt themselves or there are people who are going to hurt other people. Yeah. Um, I guess you know, the devil's in the details for me. And so uh, one, of the, one of the things that a lot of people have focused on that I maybe didn't see as much discussion of is the placement of these things within the rooms instead of somewhere else, which to me maybe would just make it more likely that they're going to get used and was, also the physical yeah. appearance of them. I agree. And one of the issues to keep in mind, though, with that is, you know, I can see where, yes, that's stigmatizing to their peers, but the potential danger in having to transport them from the room itself where they're having the behavior to a different location, especially in high schools where there may be a passing period and having to transport that person when they're being very aggressive from the classroom down the hall, you know, to where the seclusion room is located is going to increase the likelihood of somebody being injured. So, you know, I can kind of see both sides to it, but I also think for safety reasons, and I don't know, Sean, if you 
have a different viewpoint on that. No, no I don't. I mean, it, it is. It's one of the other risks. There's a, there's a risk and a reward, or there's a benefit and a side effect to every uh, option that you have on the table. So every treatment has its own negative side effects associated with it. So if we were to move the proximity of a room uh, down to, let's say, outside the vice principal's office, and we have a sixth grader that's going by fifth graders, fourth graders, third graders, all the way down to kindergartens and just takes them out as they go along the way down to that, that's, that presents more risk than one that's a little bit closer to that particular person. For other kids that, that may not be the issue at all, but the, 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 if you're going to use if you're going to use that as a safety mechanism, it's, it's better to have that nearby as opposed to not. But it, it's a, still an individual decision for it. You know, uh, I guess especially since so many of the kids are. Yeah. Sorry. sorry, are you familiar with Sean and his background? I wasn't sure. Go ahead. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I, I, my my PhD is in special education. Um, I have, uh, like I said, I've been doing this work since 1991 from direct care all the way up to uh, working in three different residential programs with kids with significant challenge behaviors, three of which were very good and world renowned and one was very bad. <laughs> and so you learn more from the bad one than you do from the, the good one. So, so I have a lot of experience with this. Well, I certainly don't mean to question anybody's credentials sure, up there. Sure. I mean, I guess every time I... I get into that discussion, I think, yeah, but I know there's experts who disagree about things all the time. So there's right. experts on both sides of, of a question like that one, almost certainly. Um, I, you know, again, I guess, you know, we've had some issues in terms of compliance. Uh-huh. I hope we can improve that by paying attention to it. But, you know, we're a large bureaucratic organization. There's, you can only improve things so much. I mean, if there's a temptation sitting right there in the room, yep. I do I worry agree. about how, A, how consistently we can expect compliance, and B, how are we going to be able to tell whether we are having consistent compliance with it? I mean, the teacher might be the only adult in the room. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, there was a recommendation made back in 2000 as far as having cameras, um, you know, by the county attorney at the time. Um, that would kind of record what's going on in these rooms, and I still think that that wouldn't be a bad idea. Right. Um, on both ends, it would protect the child, it would protect the teacher. Well, and it, it also documents the incident and, Absolutely. and, and, and everything yes. like that. Um, it, but it, it is, it was recognized, kind of to Chris's point, that uh, the violations identified by the department indicate a risk that the district could commute, commit future violations as a result of the department, uh, or of uh, that the the fact that we continue to have these rooms poses a risk of violations in the future that was brought out in the, in the state report. And uh, this is the second time in, in May that we've been cited by the State Department of Ed uh, for not following code. And, uh, we, and I appreciate everything, everything that the committee has done, and uh, we're going to need your help going forward on this. Um, also, I, I would be interested in, you know, that, uh, you know, do we really have solid evidence that social seclusion is effective in reducing the occurrence of problem behavior that frequently precipitates the use of seclusion? I don't think it reduces it. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's more a crisis intervention. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and I can't stress enough that, you know, there are others that, you know, it's, it's a tool. And, and every time this, the tool reference comes up, I think of a a 16-pound sledgehammer and an 8-ounce ball peen hammer. Yeah. And I can do everything I can do with the 8-ounce with the 16-pound hammer. Uh, well, it's just that it's, it's you know, I, I, and I, and, you know, going to, uh, you know, the numbers on the, from 8 to 12, we only had 10 incidents mm-hmm. of seclusion. But yeah. uh, the thing that really concerns me is at the younger age that it, it's being used heavily. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm really concerned that we're doing more more harm than good, and uh, would would uh, really urge us in our reviews and everything going forward to strive for alternatives. And if the and the alternatives are going to require space, and I think one of the biggest reasons why we're using these rooms is they're efficient, they're small. Well, I agree and, with and Latasha too, as far as like having district specific policy on this because you know it's going to hold staff who are using it inappropriately accountable and it's going to protect staff but, uh, who uh, are using it appropriately right well the well. state the so state's I requiring us to follow the law mm-hmm. absolutely and and that's you know that's uh, policy is policy but i mean the law is the law yeah. and i mean that's why we are compelled i think it'll help with consistency across the district yes you know so 
can, can, can we talk about the physical appearance and atmosphere of these things, whether they're in the classroom or out? I mean, it seems like the ones I've seen, it's like we're trying to make them depressing. I, I can't speak to that. I know in, in Thomas Mays in one of his uh, his um, uh, pieces, he's toured these and he's talked about those and and how cheery they look or, or what the, the what they actually look like is not um, anything that's that's driven by any policy, um, and and so I I don't think that um, anything um, there's anything wrong with making them nicer or or more appealing or or brighter or whatever it might be that that would make them seem uh, less to that aesthetic that you're that you're speaking of. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's an, an issue that anyone on, our, on our, our committee would have had an issue with. I have uh, one specific question and then one, more, one broader comment. Um, so one of the specific things in the Hanover report was, I'm looking on page 27, debriefing staff after seclusion. All staff involved in the seclusion, administrator and at least one of their staff member is not involved, should hold a debriefing within 48 hours after the seclusion to discuss why the seclusion occurred and how to prevent future seclusions. That to me sounds like a very good idea, no matter what, up, what form these things end up taking. Is that part of what you all are recommending? I mean, that would be in and of itself, I think, a disincentive for overusing these things. Lisa Johnson, support lead teacher. I um, am one of the Crisis Prevention Institute trainers for nonviolent crisis prevention. And part of our training and protocol within the Iowa City Community School District is the use of seclusion restraint and debriefing is a mandatory component of that. So while I don't know that we spoke specifically to debriefing within our recommendations, the additional, the additional training in an enhanced training in CPI and those nonviolent crisis physical interventions um, would again mandate that we do that debriefing. We also have monthly meetings that our CPI trainers are to attend with um, school staff so that we can help debrief through situations, um, look at where we could have de-escalated sooner. Our new training, I actually just attended today, we have a four-day trainer, we added three additional CPI trainers to our district for next year. Um, talks more about de-escalation and disengagement than our previous training has been, and um, Jane does not know this yet, but the training is considerably longer, and so based on the new enhancements, Sorry, Jane. <laughs> Based on the new enhancements, my recommendation as, as our CPI trainer is that all staff receive the new full enhanced training, which would increase their expertise in disengagement and de-escalation strategies. I would recommend that for special education staff, and I would also recommend that at the building level for all of our general education staff who work with students, because all of these behaviors do not start in isolation in a special education classroom. Okay, so I'll just make my last, it's actually two comments, I said it was one. Um, I read through the Hanover Report, and I'm just so struck by how thoroughly behavioral the whole thing is, in the classic sort of Skinnerian sense, uh, and how little it talks about reasoning with the kids. And this has always been one of my problems with the way PBIS is set up. It's all about, we're going to make the rules really clear to you, and then we're going to use rewards and punishments to get you to comply with them. Some of that's going to go on, right? But to me, if you don't pair that with some discussion of, and here's why you should do it this way, and here's you know, why, how you should start thinking about right and wrong, and how you make these decisions, it's so morally bankrupt. It comes down to, you know, the entire thing is do as you're told. Um, and so without something, an element of that, I get very disturbed by talking about behavior solely in those reward and punishment terms. I just put that out on the table. Um, and, you know, people will say, oh, that does go on, that does go on. But it's not in there. It's not in PBIS materials anywhere that I've ever seen. Um, and so I go back to our discussions that we sometimes have about we need to take more of a restorative justice approach to discipline, and I think, yes, we do. How is that consistent with talking about discipline in that way? I don't understand, exclusively in that way. So I wish we would have that work session discussion or education committee discussion about restorative justice and what it means, what we mean by it, and how much we really want to do it and how. Um, and I guess my last, I mean, my last comment is, 
this sort of reminds me of the situation a few years back when I was, before I was on the board, and we were lobbying for longer lunch periods. And one of the things we learned was that in some schools, the kids, the lunch periods were so rushed that the teachers felt like they had to actually bundle the kids up in their winter parkas and snow pants before lunch so they could rush them out to recess after lunch because that's how little time there was to function. And I just remember, you know, it's one of these decisions. You look at it and you think, I understand. I understand where the rationale came from. I understand, uh, you know, what the pressures on people that led them to that decision. But then you pull back and you say, but that's just not right, you know. And, and so I look at these rooms and, I, you know, again, I understand there needs to be a space maybe. But these are little dungeons that we have within the classrooms. I, I understand there's a rationale that you can build for them, but to me, it's just not right. I would say we got to get them out of there, and we got to get them. We, they need to, to the extent there is a confinement space somehow, which I understand there might need to be. It can't. It can't look and feel the way that those do. <clears throat> so, question. Well, and I, I just like to. <clears throat> Again, thank, thank the committee, and, and I, I would urge that if it's sooner is better than later when it comes to the work to the work session. Um, that's just that's my two cents on it. Um, I do agree that um, um, decreasing uh, seclusion rooms where they're not being used is, is essential. I like increasing the number of CPIs out there, I think from four to six was the recommendation of the committee. I think that's great, making sure that people have more training. I'm sure we'll unpack this in a work session discussion. But I also like to underline a comment that was made here tonight is that in order to um, um, evolve what we have to offer for uh, seclusion, it does require space. So. Yes, absolutely. And that's why I brought that up during our facilities master plan discussions that uh, if we truly want to address uh, health, safety, and accessibility, uh, this should have been part of that discussion. All right, further discussion? I have a couple of very quick questions. Um, Jane, you mentioned about uh, the junior highs having therapeutic classrooms. If I understood you correctly, we we had one at, at Northwest Junior High, and we're um, going to continue to provide those supports, but it's not going to be called a therapeutic classroom at this time. Oh, okay. So, um, so there are at the junior highs, or there aren't. There are the the SFAs that have the background in um, the licensed school social worker, and that's the one of the critical components. Um, with that particular support to do um, the coping skills, to do intervention with students when they're starting to um, dysregulate, when they're starting to become um, potentially, um, I don't know, aggressive is probably not the right word, but when they're, they're starting to struggle, then those people are on call and, and available. We chose to go with this model before we had somebody that transitioned between multiple buildings and Things don't always happen when that person's in a place that we're, we're now we're going to have that staff who's in that building the entire day so that they're readily available if things start to happen or for the coaching when the child's in a, in a position to receive that instruction and support too. Okay, but they're no long, there no longer is a therapeutic classroom at Northwest? Correct. Not that we're calling that correct. And, and what's happening, what, what, what's being done with the space there that, that was used for that? That'll be up to um, the, the principal to designate that particular one classroom. There'll be a classroom space designated for um, one of the special education programs that the, the team will be working on. I don't know that it will be that same classroom. Some of those structures will still be in place. Okay. And then my um, second question is, and, and if you can't answer it, completely mm -hmm. okay. Um, I'm wondering, the two no votes on your survey, um, is it possible for you to uh, um, find out which category they fell into, whether they were parents, teachers, or experts? And, and if you don't have it, it's fine. I'm just curious which category, um, if we know. Well, I'm going to look to Lisa and she completed the survey. I would say at this time we, we tried to make it as anonymous as we could so that people would feel very comfortable reporting that. Um, I, I will say that throughout the discussion, though, we had a wide variety of, of opinions and input on that. Um, People were very respectful. People were uh, very open to listening to um, different perspectives and opinions on this particular um, situation and strategy. And I feel like um, 
it might have been more comfortable for people to be able to do that in an anonymous way, even though the committee work was pretty safe, it seemed. But yeah, sure. I think what's really important is that as the committee, as our group, as our work group, we 100% agreed that we wanted seclusions to be reduced. And so we had, what you just pointed out was two people in the committee said that we wanted it reduced to zero. Mm -hmm. And so that was the, the group. So whatever the end was for that, that, that said we, we all were in, in coherence with, we want these to be decreased in a very significant way. So we're not, I just want to make sure that we're not characterizing that we pro the use of this technology. We're trying to find ways to decrease these tech, the use of this technology. So I just want to make sure that's a clarifying point. Very good. Well, thank you again to the committee for all your work. And we look forward to uh, continuing this uh, relationship and seeing progress as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the Government Finance Officers Association. This is really just an information item. I want to congratulate Leslie and Craig for uh, the Government Finance Officers Association has awarded a Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting. And uh, basically, the Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in governmental accounting and financial reporting and attainment represents a significant achievement. So congratulations, Leslie. Leslie, how many, how many is this? Seven, six, seven, eleventh consecutive year. Years, excellent. Great, congratulations. That's remarkable. For the discussion, next time on the agenda is the sustainability update. Steve, turn that over to Dwayne. Thank you. Uh, just kind of a review of some of the things that have taken place in the district in the past year with regard to sustainability. Uh, we have continued to. Uh, our long-standing and a very effective cardboard and paper recycling <coughs> program. Uh, every school has a dumpster for this purpose, and those dumpsters are picked up on a weekly basis by an independent contractor. We do pay for this service. Uh, they do deliver those materials to the city card, and I think they've been renamed, but that's where that material goes. Do I need your mic on? Or it is. I'm sorry. Any okay. closer? Sorry. Uh, so that's, that's where that material goes. Uh, we have thought about, we've kicked around, and uh, what, if it would be cost effective to use our own uh, garbage or pack, packer type truck, uh, currently that's problematic because we would we use it for food, food materials and other types of trash and garbage, and the two just don't mix. So it might mean in the future considering a second truck to do that. But for now, it works. Uh, also, all the paper that is shredded in the district is also recycled at our request, so that's a, a plus. Uh, we have two pilot recycling programs in the district. One is at North Central, where they separate out cans, bottles, empty milk, and yogurt curtains, uh, and those are picked up at no cost to the district and delivered to a recycling center. So that's been a pretty good program. There's a science teacher at North Central Junior High who's been very active and has gotten grants, and they've since in instituted a food waste recycling program uh, where they take most food, food uh, waste material with the exception of meat. Uh, it is a little problematic because the students, ha in order to make it work, uh, the students and staff have to make sure that plastic knives and forks and plastic plates and paper napkins and things like that don't get mixed into it. But it has worked. Uh, I think they'd like to see some expansion of that program. Uh, also at Mann Elementary, we have a very enthusiastic, energetic, energetic pa parent, Stevie Toomey, and they, they have a recycled milk carton program there. She'd like to see that expanded to other parts of the district, uh, and I've asked Dave McKenzie to work with her and see what, see what it would take. It is very labor intensive, and it would, would require a lot of volunteer help, but she's on the right track. The students at Mann are very supportive of the program, and it's working well there. So I would commend her for that. Uh, surplus furniture is another area. Uh, we, we have a furniture replacement cycle. We have systematically begun re replacing furniture in the district. Some of the furniture replaces beyond repair. Some of it uh, does go to the landfill, but before we do that, we remove the metal components. And last year, we were able to divert about 15,000 pounds to a metal recycler uh, from excess furniture that was no longer usable. So that's, that's the district's doing the right thing there as well. Uh, we have considered, uh, well, and some, some furniture is reassigned to other schools uh, if, it's, if it's in good use, and other schools have a purpose for it. it almost a day doesn't go by where 
uh, a staff member in the district will, will not come to the physical plant and ask to see the, the extra material because they made another desk or another bookcase and things like that. And we keep all that in inventory so it does get recycled in that way. Uh, some of it that's beyond uh, our use does go to the auction house. It hasn't happened for a while, uh, but, but the results are pretty minimal. Uh, we have considered uh, talking to some charitable organizations and see if there's some excess furniture that might go. There, there are organizations that will take this furniture to schools in Central and South America. I've done it before. I've sent railroad carloads south, uh, and I think it's a very worthwhile thing to do. Uh, other schools gladly accept this material uh, and see it as a real, a real treat to have. So. I'd like to see us start uh, doing some of that and look into that program. Have you talked with uh, Habitat uh, Restore or anything as far as with your surplus furniture or the salvage barn? Uh, not specifically with Habitat, but I have, and I can't recall his name at the moment, uh, a person that I believe works for the Methodist Church that does that, some type, that type of work. Well, uh, I can get to that information if yeah, you're interested. The salvage barn does take furniture and things, yeah. things along those. The certain, uh, what should I should say, uh, serviceable furniture yeah. type of a thing. I'll, I'll and, certainly contact them. I, and I, uh, as far as uh, rotary, uh, the FAMSCO project has sent a lot of uh, materials down to uh, Guatemala. And yeah. Central America here in Iowa City, they would be another organization well, with any surplus. And honestly, we're going to have some surplus material or uh, furniture from Longfall, so it's become kind of urgent that we figure out what we're going to do. We've just loaded up a couple semi-loads of furniture, and I think that would be a good use for it. Uh, we were going to focus on that after we get school started this fall and we have a little more time to deal with it. So, But we'll probably be bringing you some information like that. I seem to remember from a previous sustainability update on it, and maybe I missed it if you uh, mentioned it today, but there's, there's little things and big things that, that we can do. Yes. Um, simple little things are, you know, I think we had talked about this before, is double-sided double printing, right? Um, obviously, almost every initiative <laughs> that, you, that you spoke about with recycling, so on and so forth, uh, right now. Um, it, how do we, I mean, we, we've increased the number of geothermal buildings that we right. have here. That's, that's the yeah. big ticket items. We've, in, we've increased uh, energy efficient lighting and windows and and uh, materials that we use in our building construction. I'm curious. You're, you're still on my thunder, but go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I thought, <laughs> so you were getting to the big ticket items. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you if you were going to get to the big ticket items, yeah. so I will zip well, it right there. It, well, I'll just, I'll tee off on that if you don't mind. But we have, you know, put a lot of geothermal systems in. They won't fit in every building. An example, Man Elementary is probably one that won't work. There's just not enough ground there to do it, even if we use the city park. We are, we are going to investigate it, but... It, it may not work. And so there are buildings where that may not be feasible, but wherever it works and wherever it can work, we will do it. And we, I know for a fact that it, we can save 30 to 40% in energy costs and add the cost of air conditioning and still be below what it takes to heat, heat these buildings. And I've done it. I've done studies in the past and had, can show you time and time again how it works. Uh, it's a very cost-effective way to leverage infrastructure money to lower our costs in the general fund. Uh, so they're obviously very efficient, but we're also doing windows and doors. We're doing additional insulation. We're doing. We're even looking at the specifications of our roofing materials. Does it? Does it? Do we want to absorb heat or do we want to reflect heat? It's kind of a sixty thousand dollar question in Iowa because we're kind of in between. If you're up north, you definitely want to absorb it, and if you're south of here, you want to reflect it. So we've been trying to work with some neutral colors to to kind of balance that out. And there's an ongoing debate that I have almost on every project with the engineers about that. We've been doing a lot of LED lighting, lighting controls, daylight harvesting. We're doing classrooms where if, there are, if there's natural daylight coming in, there's photo sensors that sense that, and it will shut down one bank of lights. It takes a little adjustment on the part of the staff and the students, but we're doing it. Are there ways to override it? Sure. But we're providing the system and the means to do that. We're doing occupancy sensors so lights go off. And you walk into a restroom today at Liberty High School, and the lights come on. Okay, and when you leave, after a certain amount of time, they go off. But classrooms are doing the same things. So we're trying to save energy that way. And we're putting in energy management systems. We're putting in digital controls, and we're doing energy systems so that our goal is to get to a centralized uh, computer at the physical plant where we can pull up any classroom, any room in the district, tell you if the heating and cooling system is working, tell you what the temperature is, 
uh, tell you what the humidity is, all those things from one location. Uh, it's, it takes time, but when you get it done, it really works. I've done it. So uh, we've also had our electricians kind of systematically going through a lot of the older buildings and updating the lighting systems using grants from Mid-American Energy and Alliant Energy, and they uh, are very cost-effective ways to, to improve it, and it, it eventually saves us money when we get to the renovation of a building if it's already been done. So we've already put in electronic ballast in almost every school, and now we're going around and starting to work on LED lighting using those electronic ballasts. So we're making improvements almost systematically throughout the district, the di district, and it's I think starting to pay dividends. Uh, we also are looking at doing a solar voltaic system. I know it's been a, a, a discussion. It's been it's been brought up several times to this board. And you should know that I have directed the engineers, uh, the mechanical engineers at Liberty High School, and we're going to we're going to put a solar voltaic system on that bus office slash small maintenance building that we want to build as part of Phase Two at Liberty High School. Uh, they think it can be self-sufficient, so I haven't seen the final calculations or the final design, but they have been working on it for several months. So when we get around to Phase Two at Liberty, what we're going to do is. We've even changed the roof structure so that it, so that it can support this system. Will, will that structure be, which energy provider will that structure be serviced by? <laughs> That's a great question. Because Alliant Energy is on the western half of exactly. our project and Mid-American is on the eastern half, so it will be on the eastern half. And are there, just out of curiosity, I know both probably have incentives, or I mean, maybe they don't. Well, they do, but they've kind of lowered them. Okay. Uh, they're they're kind of I don't think the utility companies are aggressive. They don't. Yeah, they probably wants to not be generating our own. Right, and a lot <laughs> and a lot of so photovoltaic systems like what the county's doing, they actually feed energy back into the grid. It's metered, uh, and then you just reduce your utility bill. Right. I think in this particular structure, we may be able to use the energy, and we'll, we're still working on that detail. So, anyway, that that we're going to do it. And Great I just, news. I've pushed them to do it, and uh, I think the engineers are behind it. So, uh, And then we're also considering, and it's been discussed, and we need to get it back on the front burners, doing a, a solar, same type of solar voltaic panel system on the hitting facility at City High. Uh, so uh, one of our district alums is really active in, in that business and wants to promote it, and I've asked him for some more information, and uh, our AD over there, Terry Coleman, is really behind it and is pushing mm -hmm. it. So. That you may see that in the near future as well. And then future plans, I think the little things, okay, that we've had several meetings over the last few years and we've had students involved and students are really great about thinking about the small things. You know, the double-sided paper and printing, things like that, that they can do at their schools. There's been some really active students from both city and west uh, that have been on the committee. So I think our focus this next year is going to be to talk to more students and get some ideas from them because they're really they're really on the cutting edge. They're out there every day thinking about things that we take for granted. So with that, I'll answer any questions. Right now. Two quick questions. Sorry, Brian. You got it. Uh, it kind of plays into your future plans, but is there any reason that the rest of the North Liberty schools wouldn't um, do the same thing or something similar to what North Central has done as far as um, the plastic bottles, metal cans, empty milk, and yogurt containers that are being picked up at no cost? I think the I think the answer to that is is there staff and student support to do it in those buildings? I mean, we can promote it, but they're still going to have to be involved because the building custodian typically there's a custodian that's always there during lunch, you know, and they're pretty busy trying to keep things clean and tidy and orderly, and so it's going to take some some commitment from staff and students. But certainly, we'd support it if they want to do it. It works. And my second question may be more directed towards Adam, but. Do you think at the secondary level with the one-to-one -one computers that there'll be a reduction of paper usage? We think long-term, yes. Uh, right off the bat, I kind of doubt it, to be entirely honest. Um, we'll definitely see a transition towards digital, uh, and there's a ton of room in, in our district for reduction in paper consumption. Um, I don't think that one-to-one, -one, based upon the experiences of other districts we've talked to, will overnight cause that effect. Um, Long-term, though, I think we can see it, and other districts have seen it when they've made concerted efforts to steer resources towards uh, digital. 
just just to follow up on that, you say there's uh, reductions that could be made that you see. So is that something you're going to pursue? Uh, yeah, we're actually pursuing it right now. Um, we're looking at uh, with Liberty because we're deploying a new printer fleet there, obviously, since it's a new building. Um, one of the things that we're trying out is print release stations, um, which will allow us to basically do walk around printing. You don't print to a particular printer. You print, generally speaking, you release your print jobs, similar to what uh, is in place at a lot of organizations. University of Iowa comes to mind, has this technology in place. Um, but it's a cost-effective way to prevent any uh, extra printing that you know, goes to the wrong printer, no one picks it up, someone sends five jobs because it doesn't print the first time. This would prevent that. Um, and so that's something that we're exploring there, but hoping to roll out uh, large scale. But we're in the very early phases of looking at that. Thanks. Uh, Dwayne, thanks to everybody involved in uh, recycling, conservation, alternative energy. And it's just plain saving us money, right? And in the face of tight uh, state funding, we need all the things we, we can get. And, Facilities master plan is really driving that, and the sooner we do it, the better. It, it, you know, using uh, infrastructure funds like Pebble and sales tax, and even the old bonds for that matter, to to improve your energy benefits directly the general fund because our utility bills are paid out of that. They're not paid with those other funds. So it's leveraging one fund to improve the other, and it, it's an argument that you can win every day of the week. And in addition to that, you know, we we have brought in literally hundreds of thousands of dollars from the utility companies to make energy improvements on our buildings. You've seen them. You know, I think a year ago we brought a check here for almost $400,000 for work that we'd already done. You're going to see another check coming in on Liberty when we get it done it's of several hundred thousand dollars for improvements that we've made. So that all helps too. Well, it's not just about, you know, it, it is very much about saving saving money, but it's also about, you know, if we're, if we're teaching our, our next generation how to be responsible um, citizens and, and stewards of, <laughs> of the earth. Yeah. We want to decrease our carbon footprint, obviously. Uh, here's here's a, a crazy question. I mean, obviously, um, again, a big ticket item is the changes in transportation that are going to occur with the bus barn that you mentioned. Um, I mean, we should have less busing when it comes to uh, the kids that we've been busing to West High from North Liberty all these years. But um, uh, on, a, on a smaller scale, uh, I'm, I'm curious, if, uh, just another simple thing, are we, are we using recycled paper in our, when we buy rims of paper? I can't answer that. Do we know? Uh, uh, we would if we could, but most of the uh, copy machines and the printers today struggle with some of that paper, and so we have to walk that fine line between what can you get through there and not have repeated jams and downtime and just wasted paper versus actually getting a, a useful copy. So um, we're, we're working with, with the, uh, our paper provider for that when we can, but uh, that's the, they're making those machines so, so fine that... So, uh, so, so we have to get Dunder Mifflin on the phone. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, further discussion? All right, thanks again, Duane. Very good. Next item on the agenda is the EL, EL, ELP program laptop purchase. Adam? Give you a bit of background on this. Uh, this is a request that I received in May uh, from the ELP program. The ELP program currently has a uh, deployment of MacBooks that were purchased six years ago that are used. Uh, within all of the elementary buildings, primarily for uh, robotics, programming activities, things like that. Um, those devices are aging out per our six-year replacement cycle. They're also seeing a lot of uh, support issues. And so they're requesting that those be replaced with um, 214 uh, Windows laptops. Um, just to preempt you know, any questions that there might be, uh, we did explore the possibility of Chromebooks for that. Um, as of right now, uh, LEGO's EV3 robotics devices do not fully support um, Chromebooks. You can use them with Chromebooks, but they don't have the same capabilities as the desktop software. Um, because we are in the uh, first year of our virtual application deployment, similar to in other buildings where we're keeping specialty labs for industrial technology and that sort of thing, 
Um, we do want to uh, make sure that these devices are fully supported in terms of drivers for the robotics units, that sort of thing. So that's why we're recommending Windows laptops for this. Uh, these are lower cost laptops than we um, have deployed for general staff use in that uh, the specifications required are not as high, but they still do meet our minimum specifications. And this quote that I'm presenting is substantially better in the pricing from um, the negotiated uh, agreements that the district's part privy to are listed there as well. This uh, 60, $655 per unit pricing is uh, significantly below that. Um, happy to answer any questions. On, uh, so you're saying the main reason we're doing this is because it, it supports these robot uh, curriculum better? The robotics curriculum and they have programming software that's used, yep. Now the actual robot uh, curriculum that we have, uh, how long have we had that? Is that the type of thing we could replace in a year and then all of a sudden the admin, the, the, the why we, we're making this decision is, is moot at that point. Uh, what's the longevity of the curriculum it's supposed to support? Yep, so it's, it's been in the district for a very long time. I don't know exactly. It certainly predates me by many years. Uh, the district has been using it for a minimum of six years um, in that that's what this, the MacBooks that they have now were originally intended to support. And at that time, it was Lego Mindstorms. Uh, since then, Lego, which still owns the, the product suite, um, has changed to the EV3 platform, and that's really a standard across the state. There are robotics leagues and things that our students participate in that all use that EV3, those EV3 devices, um, so it's really a standard. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. What may change uh, would be supportability via Chrome OS or you know, through the cloud if they were to, you know, find a way to move uh, the programming of the devices and interface um, off of a local software uh, install on the computer itself. But at this point, Lego has released no plans to do that, so we can't anticipate when that might happen. And the old uh, uh, MacBooks, what are happening to those? Yep, so those will be sold. Um, as you're aware, right now we are recycling a good deal of equipment, so we actually have a um, bid RFP that just completed for sale of the staff laptops and some of the desk, uh, some of the computers that we pulled out of buildings. And then we have another one going out that these will be included in, which will be desktops that we're pulling out of buildings. Um, and then also some of the uh, six-year-old devices that we're pulling out for replacement this summer. So those will be put out for bid for recyclers. Just for reference, the RFP that we just had out um, came back at about 80, on average, about $80 per device, which for a six-year-old laptop is actually pretty good. Um, given that these are MacBooks, I'd anticipate that the total for those would be a little bit higher. Um, I, I'm afraid Adam's going to start taking, taking too much personally. The things I ask, uh, I'm on the fence about it, um, just because I mean, I'm fine with replacing old equipment. Robotics sounds like a worthy thing to have an ELP, but I do wonder if the alternative use of the money is to serve more students in ELP. Yeah, and you know, one thing I will say, and, and if Diane wants to add anything about this, um, I don't know if there's, there's relevant information. Yeah, you know, I obviously don't control the ELP budget, and this request came directly from the ELP program, so I know that they determined that this was something they wanted to spend money on. It's not something that we required them to do, um, so you know, I guess I'd put that out there as an answer to that concern. Yeah. I mean, we had a work session a while back where we talked about kind of the pressures on ELP financially and well, I just throw that out there. I mean, serving more kids is a worthy goal too. Mm -hmm. All right, and your team motion. I move we approve the purchase of 214 laptops for the ELP program. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? All right, Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast, and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Adam. 
Stand with agenda, Spanx 9, Dwayne. Thank you. Uh, we have four projects to discuss with eight approvals. Uh, the first one is the City High Wall, Jim Wall. And you heard me talk about this, I think, at the last board meeting. Uh, and there's some structural needs uh, in, the, in the part of the wall that runs parallel with the gym floor. This is the old gym at City High. And uh, there's some steel that needs to be replaced. Uh, however, the bids came in, I felt, too high. They came in, uh, we got three bids, and they ranged from 304000 to 423000 and that would be replacing some steel and replacing the windows. Uh, I talked to the uh, engineer on the project and said, is this a true emergency? Does it need to be done now? Uh, and they assured me that no, it did not, that there was some safety still there. I mean, it would, that it was okay if this didn't happen until next spring or next summer. Uh, and so my advice is to reject the bids and to rebid this when the climate is better uh, this this winter going into spring. I think we can get some better prices than if we did it now. Yes, sir. Um, okay. uh, you gave us the the bids that we received. Do you have an idea what what your, I your engineers give us? Uh, and you're yeah. saying it's over oh, it's overbid. Do you have an idea what? We were looking at two hundred thousand. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to get it closer. It may be two fifty by next spring, but I I just felt like. The contractors are busy. It's just the wrong time of year. We got a late start on the design work, but the design work's done. So let's let's hang on to it, not waste it. We still need to do it, but we'll bid it in January or February when we when builders are looking for work. Uh, I feel that it's based on what they tell me. It's safe to do that. And so my advice good. is to reject. And that. every time we've done that, we've come back and gotten a right. better yeah. price based on the timing. And, yeah. Yeah. So and one then, question on that, Dwayne. Sorry. Excuse uh, me. One question on that. Mm -hmm. So um, originally, I think if we would have done it now, it would have happened. The work would have started over the summer. Um, right. Think being in the spring will have any impact on usage of that space at all? Or well, not? we we may bid it in the spring, but the work may not start till school's actually out. Okay. We can we can phase into it. Uh, part of the part of the project this year is we're actually putting a new a new roof on there as we speak. They're out there. They're doing some asbestos abatement, and they're getting ready to put new roofing on top of it. So we're going to lap it over those walls and tack it, keep it from moving. So that part of the project will have already been completed. So getting it done over the summer will be easier. This summer it was asbestos abatement, roofing material, and replace a wall, and it would have been really tough. And we did move some programs from City High to Southeast, yep. and we're going to leave them at Southeast because of the because we're still doing the roofing. There's still men working up above, so uh, I think it'll be okay. We'll just bid it, knowing that the project's done towards summer. I take it serious because I mean I, I don't want I want to make sure it's safe that we can get by and, and enough said I guess. Uh, the other project, physical plant, you know, we, we talked about doing some ADA restrooms. We talked about improving the entrance there to make it more secure and more energy efficient. And I still think we can do it. I just don't think we can do it with the prices that we got. So we got a price of 215000 and 217000 And my recommendation, again, is to reject those bids and to consider doing these as smaller projects with our own staff when we have time. Excellent. Yes, sir. Excellent. And... Uh uh, again, uh, do you have a estimate on what the cost of the project is? I, I was hoping to get it for 150 or less. Those bathrooms are expensive. Right. Uh, and, you know, there may be parts of it where we'll have to go out and get us a, a, a plumbing contractor to run the sewer lines, things like that. But I think we can do it ourselves. It'll just take time. Excellent. Uh, it still needs to be done. Uh, the third one is a change request for Hoover uh, Elementary School. We've had very few of them, but we have one for $12,300 in the district, myself, I guess, uh, requested a change in the ceiling and the closets in the building, uh, and we, we added some roofing material they thought was needed to make the project a little better, and uh, we also uh, added some technology work there, so that was a $12,000 add. Uh, the last item is the West High School Phase 1, but there are two, two different packages, one for the project itself and one for the kitchen equipment that goes in the project. We've been treating that differently. We did the same thing at Liberty High. Uh, and so this package is for that kitchen equipment, and the design work is done, so that's Phases 3, 4, and 5. Uh, those drawings, if you're interested, they're at the physical plant uh, sitting on my desk. <laughs> Looked at them today. 
Uh, and then uh, step six, set the public hearing, which we talked about earlier in the meeting. So with that, I'd answer any questions you might have. I need to entertain a motion. Oh, uh, just one quick question on the on the change or, on on change orders. Um, and if my memory serves me correctly, does a change order add ten days to a completion, or or do change orders vary depending on the change order as far as uh, extending the completion date? Well, there are projects where change orders, like road projects, for example, what they typically add days to the project because they've lost days due to weather. Since I've been here, I haven't granted one day extension on any project because we know the students are coming. It has to be done. So we, we have stayed away from that. So uh, if it required more effort on the part of the contractor because we made a request, then they're going to have to step up to the plate and maybe do some overtime. It, we'll pay for it, but there's, there's just no extending projects here. Okay. Well, I, I thought, it, and maybe it's my uh, misrecollection, but I thought the, the completion date on the pen project was attributed to change orders and that yeah, it was the, considered still on time even though it was past the right the, there, the approved time because of the change orders so there were things there that now? weren't done properly at the end that we asked them to redo and that particular project was complicated because there was an eight classroom addition that was added on and the students were still in the building and we weren't able to use those eight classrooms until the end of the construction period if they had gotten them done sooner yes I said many times it would have made the project go smoother at the end if we could have shuffled some people in the building but uh, substantial it was substantially completed and what that's a term that you may hear a lot in construction and that means that yes we know there are punch list items and yes we know there's some things that are undone but the building is substantially completed you can get a certificate of occupancy which we had at Penn if you have that certificate of occupancy when day, the day school starts, you're in pretty good shape uh, because they don't like to give us temporary certificates. So that's what happened at Penn. We did get the CO. We did have the substantial completion. But, yes, there were things that needed to be done after they moved in. But typically, I'm not very, very uh, receptive to recommending any days be added to a school project because we need to get them done. Entertain a motion. I move that we approve the appendix nine items as presented. Second. Further discussion? Can we ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. Next up is items of drawn consent. And I know we have a long uh, work session meeting with people waiting for us, so hopefully we can move quickly. Yep. Number six, yep. Phil? Number six. Well, I think number six is significant, um, and I uh, would just like an explanation on uh, uh, why this group was selected and, and what other groups were uh, potentially uh, contacted for this. I know there's a business uh, identical to this in uh, uh, in Iowa City that does this exact same service. I wonder if they were contacted and given an opportunity to bid. And the, the short answer to that is no. And the reason was uh, we have experience, direct experience with gov.deals. They cater only to government entities. The University of Iowa and Iowa City both use this service. And it when you get up, when you get a chance to see Liberty High School, the best example I can give you is there's some music practice rooms up there that are probably twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a piece if you go out and buy them. We bought them for literally pennies on the dollar. We bought them through Gov. Deals through the University of Iowa. They used to use eBay, but they've gone almost exclusively to Gov. Deals. It's worked really well for them. Uh, the city is now using Gov. Deals, and they've sold trucks and equipment. We want to try it to get to, for some of our trucks, instead of just taking, again, pennies on the dollars to trade them in with them. No, I, I, no I, yeah. you, uh, believe me, and, and uh, I, I was the one that uh, was concerned so, about uh, the city high bleachers going to Texas yeah. for a racetrack and that the, our temporaries at West High that are down in Washington still for sale and that a freezer that uh, uh, could have gone to table to table that didn't go to anybody except the vendor. And, and I appreciate and applaud 
you, you doing this. It's just my uh, main question was, is why wasn't uh, Heartland Recovery in Iowa City, which provides the same service, this uh, is contacted? This is an approved contract for the state of Iowa. They're an approved vendor for government entities. So that, and because they catered just to government entities, we felt it was the best best for us. So frankly, I didn't go any further. Okay. And this is a five. This is a five-year contract with these guys? Uh, I don't know if it's a contract. It's a resolution. I think it's just an ongoing thing. We, we will have to pay 7.5% fees on whatever they sell. Right. And, you know, on, on, on some of this stuff, and, and I'm also just concerned, you know, will, will the board be asked going forward, this, these assets are going to be liquidated, or is this something that uh, will just happen without board approval, and uh, where will the money go? Well, Craig, Craig can verify this when he gets back, but I think if it exceeds a certain dollar amount, let's say 25000 we have to have board permission to, to dispose of property like that. But if it's a smaller item, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars, I think we're probably at liberty to, to put that on there without board approval. And then, like, if, you know, our shop equipment, which is in storage, a lot of it, um, I'd hate to see that auctioned off. It's um, just putting that out there in advance but uh, that was I believe that was purchased with Perkins money I mean is our I'm, I'm, uh, I'm assuming that we're keeping the money going to the right pots and things like that and well the, the equipment that was purchased with Perkins money uh, we've asked uh, Scott Jefferson who's the one of the administrators at City High and his father who's a, a machine and tool and die worker they come out and looked at all that equipment and determined that what was really still usable for the program, but we haven't disposed of any of it. It's, it's sitting in the high beat warehouse, and I have no desire to move it until somebody higher up than me says get rid of it. Okay, and, but on the money uh, portion of that, is it going to go yeah, back into the general you, fund or into Pebble? How is, how is yeah, that going to be? Well, yeah. It would generally be general fund for any of those dispositions. Okay, so like the, I know the snow truck is mentioned that that could be one of the first items going through this service. Right. Um, that's going to go, even though that was purchased with Pebble, it's going to go into the general fund. Okay. I think that's kind of the normal operating procedure, but I think the board does have some discretion if they want to change it. But oh, that'd be it's another discussion. Miscellaneous item, you want it to go to the general fund, yeah. All right, for the discussion, entertain a motion. I move that we approve item six. Second. For the discussion, Kim Murray vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Liebig, Deloach, Kersling, Lynch, and Ressler voting yay, and directors Hemingway and Rotland voting nay. All right, number 13. Yeah, and, and I, uh, I'll just say that we can put 13 and 14 together, uh, if that's okay. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, I'd just like Dwayne to, to explain uh, his uh, selection and, and uh, going forward on this. Well, it's not so much a selection as a continuation. The Shive Hattery has been doing this for many, many years before I got here, and they have, they've done a good program. Every year we look at all the buildings, we walk all the roofs, we check all the tuck pointing, we check all the masonry, we, and they have a, a really good plan. It's been put in place, and many of the projects I bring to you are because of that. And uh, windows, for example, at Corville Central were part of this. Uh, uh, roofing projects that we've done around the district. We just, and we're doing some siding issues at, at Tate. We're doing City and West High press boxes. All that is, is, is coming out of this program, and we use these designers to help us with those projects. I move uh, that we approve uh, 13 and 14. Second. For the discussion, Kim Murray to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thanks, Kim. 15? Yeah, and we'll do uh, 15 and 16 together. Um, again, on this one, uh, you know, we've got a, 
snow truck that uh, I would argue hasn't out, out lived out its uh, life cycle. Um, and I think at Liberty, we'd be better served with an end loader than a uh, uh, pickup anyway. Um, well, you want me to answer you, that? You can, you can respond yeah. to it. I know that this last year, uh, we didn't get a lot of snow use out of our equipment. Right. The year before, minimal. I, I think it's reasonable to ask why a 10-year-old truck needs to be disposed of. And so I asked that question <laughs> and uh, went out and looked at the truck. And apparently, uh, before we brought grounds crew on board, uh, we those trucks only got used for snow plowing. And then they sat the rest of the year. They just sat out in the yard. And this particular truck has deteriorated pretty bad. It was used for basically snow plowing at West High, and that was it. Uh, now that we have grounds on, we are starting to use these trucks 12 months out of the year because we're hauling tractors and lawnmowers and, and mulch and you name it, and we use these trucks. So these, these are straight trucks basically with, with dump beds on them. They're not pickup trucks. They're, they're state, what I would call a straight truck type setup. And uh, we, we just systematically been going through the trucks and they, this one is in dire need. The second request is for a new truck to deal with the new schools you know we have we have hooveries coming on with a lot of parking lot there a lot of square footage we've got liberty in the parking lot up there is awesome it's big but it's going to even get bigger uh so we just have a lot of needs and if we had another elementary school up north so that would say the one truck is to replace a truck that's aged to the point where it really isn't usable isn't safe and the second one is to to enhance the fleet to because of the additional property all right entertain a motion 15 and 16. I move that we approve items 15 and 16. Second. For the discussion. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Liebig, Deloach, Rotland, Kirschling, Lynch, and Ressler voting yay and director Hemingway voting nay. Thanks, Kim. Number 17. Yeah, 17 and 18 we can go together. Um, on this one, uh, we, and thank you for providing the original RFPs and, and things on that. And, and in the future, if it's possible, uh, I know that that was something that uh, uh, I, I think I'll, I, if we could just kind of make that just standard practice, that's fine. That, that, sure. that'd be great. Um, we uh, sought out uh, two two uh, bidders, and we only received one back on both. Uh, do you have any any explanation as to why? Uh, well, and the other bidder is local. Is it, I think it's Midwest. Uh, yeah, it's across the street from me. Yeah, and we've asked them several times, and I think they just feel like they can't compete with Frontline. Well, I, I went and talked with him okay. and, and asked him why, you know, I just, that's why didn't you submit a bid? And he said to me that uh, it's the central hydraulics oh. and that he does, doesn't do it. And, uh, and here again, I'm going to be the guy that bitches about doing business with Des Moines firms, but he recommended a Des Moines company to get a second bid. Really? Uh, truck Equipment, I believe, is the place. Right, I know and, and, you know, yeah. I'm sure you know them. <laughs> uh, but uh, so my reason for pulling this and, and, and uh, discussing this was is that um, I am always a, a big proponent on having more than one bid and, I, and, and that. I don't, uh, if it's, if it's bid as central hydraulics, I'm just letting you know in advance, Midwest is going to not bid on it because they don't get into that, that type of work. Fair enough. And, uh, I would encourage you to seek other bidders in the future and, uh, would urge that this get rebid, uh, with a second bidder. Entertain a motion. I move that we approve items 17 and 18. there a second? Second. Further discussion? Kim Murray to vote. Online voting is open.
All votes have been cast and the motion fails with directors Liebig, Hemingway, Rotland, and Ressler voting nay and directors Deloach, Kersling, and Lynch voting yay. All right, thanks, Kim. Last item on the agenda is agenda setting, the 27th. Yeah, um, could we get a uh, update on the Shimmick Playground? Steve, any problems? Nope, we can definitely take care of that. All right, go I'd on like on. to put an agenda on, I'm sorry, did you want to? No. I'd like to put an item on to discuss the currently pending, possibly by then not pending anymore, petition that the uh, Hoover Group might submit. Um, well, I just, put, it's not actually due by that day, but I don't want to get into a position where if there are legal issues, we don't have time to get an opinion about it. And so if we could just sort of get out on the table, you know, are there any issues with this? If so, it gives us a couple of weeks to, uh, to figure out, figure them out. And they may, they may make a submission by two weeks from today. The Save Hoover Group is trying to get a, enough signatures to get the issue of the demolition of Hoover School put onto the ballot. Under the statutes, arguably, they can do that if they get enough signatures. Um, but again, if there's going to be an issue about it, I'd just like to know what it is. Wouldn't that be for them and some attorney? I'm sorry, say again? I mean, like, if, how is that connected? To, to our purview. Yes. Oh, because uh, if they present us with the signatures, we're supposed to act on it if they've complied with, with what they're supposed to do. Um, so if there's going to be some, and again, the statute that governs it talks about how the, the board shall put it on the, or forward it to the auditor to put it on the ballot. Um, and so we might have to, I mean, we could, in theory, might have to vote on it two weeks from tonight. Uh, but even if, even if they don't submit it by that day, because I think they technically have till the 29th, um, it would be just useful to have a moment to figure out if there's any objections to it so we could get we could get some legal opinion on it before we have to vote on it. Is there any disagreement with that? <laughs> All right, we'll add it. Anything else for the 27th? I was wondering if we could um, receive an update from administration on voluntary transfers. I'd be interested in knowing um, the numbers, but more so um, what the rules are. We haven't talked about it for a while, and since we're, you know, we're not close to the beginning of school yet, but we'll be there soon enough, I'd be interested to just know ahead of time things like um, are there hard deadlines? What about kids that move into the district after um, school starts? Um, specifically, I'm, I'm thinking of situations like Kirkwood and Alexander where kids have been given the option to voluntary transfer and we've said we would allow that. Um, just wondering if we could get an update on those things. Is that possible or is it time sensitive or is it easy? No, we can definitely do that. We've processed most of those transfers, but I think what Director Rotland's speaking about is, you know, kind of potential issues that could arise at the start of the school year, so it'd probably be good if we had that conversation discussion. Sounds good. All and I already trip. sent an email outlining most of my questions on that, so you can just right. refer to that. Yes, yeah, so yes. Pertaining to those questions. What's that? Pertaining to those questions. Yeah, it was in the bottom of another email, so. Sounds good. All right, Shimmer, can we petition and voluntary transfer? Anything else? Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The, the uh, work session will start immediately following at the back of the meeting. This meeting is adjourned. Or back of the room.